I get a text so I cast. I come bebopping into my office, sit down here at my desk, fire up my computer. I'm all excited to watch the next episode of The Rings of Power. Ready to make another video. Just as I'm ready to hit that good old play button. Oh man, my desk is really messy. I got to take care of that. Oh, and it's dusty too. And the floors could use a good vacuuming. My videos, I need to rearrange them. Now the question is, do I do alphabetical or by year they came out? I'll just try both, see which one I like the best. I know, I can check social media. Got to see what's going on out there. Wouldn't want to miss out on anything. And then I see everybody's losing their ever-loving minds. I'm being told in episode 7, Doogie Elrond is making out with Galadriel. No, they didn't do that. I watched the episode. Oh, Lordy. Yep. Sure enough, they have Doogie Elrond's second face with Galadriel. Hey, wait a minute. Anybody keeping track of Doogie Elrond's hands? Judging by Galadriel's reaction, he was also busy giving her the power of many. Unlike all the hoopla I saw on social media, I'm not shocked, disgusted, but I'm not shocked at what's going on in the Rings of Power. If you understand what passes for thought in the minds of people like the writers of the Rings of Power, this is all too predictable. You can spot it coming a mile away. The message, intersectional theory, whatever you want to call what's going on in Hollywood these days, it's not a philosophy built around reason. It's an ideology driven by emotion. I feel I'm doing good. I feel I'm right. I feel I'm justified. Before we deal with whatever is going on with Doogie Elrond and Galadriel, blah, we first have to back up and talk about episode 7 as a whole. This episode is supposed to be the payoff for what we've been promised from before the season started, what the whole season has been allegedly building towards. Battle, action, spectacle, Lord of the Rings meets Game of Thrones meets whatever else you can insert. It's none of that. In actuality, this show reminds me of those made-for-TV miniseries you used to see back in the 70s and 80s. Their love was so strong, their passion burned hotter than the flames of war. The orcs have besieged the city of Eregion. It's not looking good. Things are getting really dire. The orcs are about to breach the walls at any moment. Oh, if only somebody would arrive just in time. We hear a horn. Ooh, I remember that. Lo, what do we see on the horizon? Verily, it is the cavalry, all lined up, ready to charge. I got to use verily. It was a stretch, but I got to use verily. The cavalry leader draws his sword, shouts, death, and charges towards the enemy. The cavalry even breaks into a wedge formation. In the rings of power, we've been given zero, nada, None. Absolutely no reason to be emotionally invested in the characters or whatever is going to happen plot-wise. The Rings of Power is trying to leech its authenticity off of our memories. It wants the same satisfying payoff without them having to do the hard work to earn that payoff. In The Lord of the Rings, we know the stakes. If Gondor falls, all of Middle-earth is screwed, and characters that we have spent two and a half movies getting to know and love are in peril. When we heard that horn and we saw the Rohirrim appear on the horizon, we knew what price they had paid, the blood and lives they had sacrificed to be able to be there at that precise moment. When King Theoden overlooked the orc army besieging Gondor, and he gave that sneer, and turned back to rally the Rohirrim, we knew the orcs were about to have a very bad day. The Lord of the Rings, books and movies, gave us a reason to care, gave us a reason to become emotionally invested in the characters and the plot. Once we had a reason to care, tension was built up slowly over time. The payoff, the explosive release of that tension, the moment the Rohirrim made contact with the orc army. 
in the rings of power? What are the stakes? Couldn't tell you. What happens if Eregion falls? Couldn't tell you. The Elven Cavalry, where did they come from? Couldn't tell you. Why are they there? Couldn't tell you. What difficulties did they have to overcome to be there? Couldn't tell you. This is nothing more than a reenactment, but it's not one of those high-end reenactments run by professionals who try to get every little detail right. <laughs> this is one of those shoddy slipshod reenactments run by incompetent buffoons who can't be bothered. They're just going through the motions because this scene is irrelevant. Psych! We subverted your expectations! No battle! Take that, audience! No, you lied. Hey, hey, remember that movie you love? Remember the battle in that movie that you loved? We're going to do the exact same battle. Look, look, we're doing all the steps along the way. Come on, follow us along. Just kidding. The audience's reaction isn't going to be, ooh, didn't see that coming. Interesting twist. <laughs> no, their response is going to be, screw you, writers. This scene perfectly illustrates my point about emotion being the primary driving factor behind the storytelling of the Rings of Power. The Rings of Power story is incoherent. The characters are irrational, oftentimes changing their motivations, sometimes 180 degrees from moment to moment. It's because all decisions are being driven by emotional desires of the moment. For the writers, emotion even overrides reality. Here in the real world, cavalry charges don't stop. In the rings of power, they do, though. So why did the elves give up their tactical advantage, stop the battle just at the moment it started? Adar reveals he's holding Galadriel hostage. Hey, you elves, getting ready to come over here, start a big battle where thousands of us are going to try to kill each other? Yeah, well, if you do that, I'll kill one more of you guys. Ha ha ha. Oh, no, we can't have that. Stop the battle. This is completely irrational. Makes zero sense. Why would the elves stop a battle to keep Adar from killing Galadriel? I mean, think this through for a minute. If Galadriel hadn't been captured, more than likely she'd be on a horse getting ready to charge into the orcs. She would be risking her life, possibly dying in the battle anyhow. Galadriel has been captured, though. As far as the elves know, she's been compromised. Her living or dying is completely irrelevant to the battle at hand. The only way this could possibly make any kind of sense is if Adar and the elves have also read The Lord of the Rings. Hey, you elves, you better stop your charge. Otherwise, I'm going to shiv Galadriel. And then thousands of years in the future, she won't be able to help those fellowship guys who eventually defeat Sauron. So you better stop your charge. Oh, 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 okay, we give up, we give up. But whatever you do, don't kill Galadriel. The moment Adar wheeled that cage out there, put the knife to Galadriel's head, she should have been dead. The elves had no rational reason to stop their charge. So how do they justify the elves stopping their charge? Doogie Elrond loves Galadriel so much, he's willing to stop a battle to save her life. Emotion over reason. Doogie Elrond and Adar have a parlay to negotiate Galadriel's freedom and whatever is going to happen after that with the Region, Sauron, whatever. Again, the entire conversation is completely irrational. Adar says, I'm here for Sauron. Doogie Elrond knows Sauron's in the city. Why doesn't he just say, I tell you what, you know, I'm an elf. That's an elf city. I can go into that city. I'll take some of my guys. We'll go in. We'll grab Sauron. We'll bring him out. I'll hold him down. You chop him up. Once we're all done, make sure, burn the body, whatever it takes, make sure he's dead this time. And then you give us Gladriel, and you go that way, and we'll go this way. Good? Good. Let's do it. But no. Doogie Elrond says, I'm going to defend the city. By extension, defend Sauron. The discussion, if you want to call it that, deteriorates into, you're bad. You're worse. You're worser. You're worse times 10. You're worse times 10 plus one. They're still sticking with the whole elves, orcs are no better than each other. 
Adar says, I want one of those magic ring doomahitches you made. I'll be more than happy to trade Gladriel for one of those magic ring doomahitches. Doogie Elrond says, <laughs> that ain't happening. Adar says, well, it looks like Gladriel's going to be pushing up some daisies then. Doogie Elrond says, well, I don't care. But before you do it, can I say goodbye? Adar says, make it quick. This is where we get the kiss. The very intimate, sexually suggestive kiss. We come back to emotion and the ideology driving the storytelling. A woman has to be portrayed to be in a superior position to a man at all times. If you're going to show a heterosexual kiss, bleh, why? But if you absolutely have to, the woman must initiate the kiss. Every design decision is a conscious choice. It's meant to be that way. You'll notice the focus on Gladriel's face throughout the kiss. We haven't seen Gladriel this excited since the last time she rode a horse. The rules state Gladriel has to be the one that initiates the kiss. But the constraints of the scene, Gladriel's chained. Doogie Elrond approaches her. He's the one that leans in. That means this kiss is a culmination of something that's been going on for a while now. We need to reevaluate Doogie Elrond and Galadriel's interactions leading up to this scene. Throughout the season, Galadriel has been constantly getting into Doogie Elrond's personal space, making very intimate contact with him, hands, chest. She looks into his eyes for long periods of time. She's been actively trying to seduce him. Hold your horses, Randy. What about all those scenes where Galadriel's constantly attacking, demeaning, Putting in this place, Doogie Elrond. Well, like I said, irrational. Well, now that I think about it, though, was it irrational or was it foreplay? You be the judge. The kiss? That was just Doogie Elrond finally giving in to Galadriel's advances. Doogie Elrond stopped an entire battle just so he could declare his love to Galadriel. It's the ultimate expression of a woman being in a superior position to a man. Emotion over reason. Modern intersectional theory argues that traditional views of femininity force women into choosing between one of two extremes, the Madonna or the whore. The Madonna, saintly mother-like figure, is denied her sexuality, whereas the whore is defined by her sexuality. Modern intersectional theory for years has had a wed-on for Galadriel. They view her as an iconic example of a Madonna figure, and they hate Madonna figures for lots of reasons. One of the reasons, they believe that a woman's sexuality is just one of the tools at her disposal to further her goals. The writers think they're being real clever. They're going for a twofer. Hey, Tolkien fans, you love Gladriel as a Madonna figure? <laughs> well, we'll just turn her into a whore. How do you like that, chumps? At the same time, we're going to turn Galadriel into a feminist icon, a woman willing to use her sexuality as just another tool to further her goals. Remember, a woman has to be portrayed as being superior to a man at all times. Galadriel meets Halbron, Sauron in season one. Within minutes of their meeting, they're all googly-eyed at each other with what's supposed to be all this sexual tension. Galadriel finds out Halbron is Sauron. Oh, lordy, who could have seen that coming? And then they have this bizarre dream mind, uh, who knows, sequence involving water and drowning and daggers. At the time, I remember laughing, hearing everybody say, this makes no sense. <laughs> yes, it does. Historically, these are all symbolic metaphors for sex, more specifically, female orgasm. This scene also makes a lot of sense within the context of intersectional theory, which believes heterosexual sex is violence. This would explain why Galadriel let Sauron go, why she didn't tell everybody how Brond was Sauron, why she wanted to continue making the rings even though she knew Sauron was involved. This would also explain why Galadriel becomes evasive, outright lies whenever Sauron and his connection to the rings gets brought up. They're lovers. This puts Galadriel into a superior position over Sauron. 
Randy, hey, hey, Randy, Galadriel is married. Sauron is evil incarnate. And Doogie Elron married Galadriel's daughter. He's her son-in-law. Blah! I'm going to repeat. Modern intersectional theory believes a woman's sexuality is nothing more than just another tool in her toolbox. Morality? <laughs> you must believe in good and evil, too. <laughs> Remember, the writers of the Rings of Power believe, feel, that they're going to definitively prove by the end of the series that their version of Galadriel is far superior to Sauron, far superior to Dugielron. How are they going to make this argument? Love. Love justifies everything. Emotion over reason. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, 